I know I'm taking a risk here. It seems to me we've been seeing, well, one from 1960, which qualifies as old in some circles, titled Wonderful World by Sam Cooke. <laughs> For your presence I can yearn, and I know that if it were returned, what a wonderful world it would be. I am not sure just where Chicago is. Can't say what obtuseness means. Completely ignorant of the X and Ys, have no use for swift sliding ties. But I do know two atoms make a sum, and if this turns out to be some fun, what a wonderful world it would be. Good song. Research suggests that more knowledge, scientific knowledge in particular, will not be sufficient on its own to overcome our biases. Educational biases, it seems, are culturally variable. We've long known that accepting new theories partly depends on how straightforward the proof is. Two quick examples. Einstein's theory of relativ relativity was difficult to understand, but relatively readily accepted. This was not only because sophisticated experimental results confirmed it, but also because there was little cultural baggage associated with it. The theory of evolution is also complicated, but there's no obvious experiment to confirm it. It's, hello, evolutionary. It's also a much harder go because there's lots of cultural baggage attached. That is, motivation counts. The average American doesn't really care if Einstein was right or not. Evolution, by contrast, is a body blow to some people's whole knowledge system. Just so, climate change linking Florida water rising to Pennsylvania leaf burning is a hard sell anywhere. This isn't just passive ignorance. It's a problem of sacred values. Evolution bumps into faith. How some folks understand the world and their place in it. Actually, the value doesn't even have to be sacred. A few years back, researchers tested how people's political leanings affected their views about climate change and a bunch of other hot ticket issues. They found that it's not that we're unexposed or indifferent to what scientists say. We just disagree as to what they're saying. People identified as more egalitarian and more open to government interventions to address social issues the left say, we're much more likely to say that most scientists agree that global warming is happening, that we're causing it, and we ought to stop. On the right, people identified as individualistic and wary of big government responded differently. For them, they said the opposite. How? Easy. They defined as experts those who already agreed with their position. Sure, it's called confirmation bias. We seek support for our opinions by listening to those who confirm them, not dispute them. We like to be liked, to be told that our views square with what's really going on. 
to simplification, but is true in lots of areas. In many contentious areas of public policy, we found educational levels or socioeconomic levels don't really matter. As a result, addressing these issues won't just require better science. We're going to have to try to dissociate scientific facts from deeply rooted preferences about the world we want to live in on both sides of the ideological divide. All right, to say that telling the truth has been a central issue of the presidential campaign is to, well, tell the truth. Ted Cruz, remember him? His campaign autobiography was called A Time for Truth. Before and after the conventions, both candidates in differing degrees have offered their own parcels of pesky prevarications to ponder. But here's the deal. With all the fact-checking going around, the reports apparently have little influence. Few people outside of political game watchers pay much attention. And partisan voters, they just look to the results concluding that the other guys are lying. Sadly, the truth itself as an issue is not new. It's been on the American political scene from the beginning. General Jackson is incapable of deception, his supporters insisted in 1824. Among all classes in Illinois, the nickname of Honest Abe is habitually used by the masses. A Republican newspaper said of Lincoln in 1860. Supporters of Thomas Jefferson said that his opponent, John Adams, engaged in every species of villainous deception of which the human heart in its last stage of depravity is capable. All of these guys were elected. It's been the same ever since. In more or less degree, partisan versions of the truth have abounded across the whole political spectrum. But politics highlights reality. We all have our own appreciation of the truth. We always have, we probably always will. Some of this is ego-preserving re-remembering. I was not dumped by my high school honey. We mutually agreed to see other people, she told me. <laughs> Why do we suppose Paul had to write this? Romans 1.20 following. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things God has made. So the wicked are without excuse. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. It's because we want to believe, we do believe, what is in our own immediate interest to believe. And as I read in a recent editorial, the history of truth is strange and has been getting stranger. Most discussion of the truth itself comes from philosophers who explain their ideas by telling these little stories about experiments they do in their heads. By the time Descartes tried to convince himself he didn't exist, he found he couldn't convince himself he didn't exist, thereby that proved he did exist. Michael Lynch's fascinating new book, The Internet of Us, subtitled Knowing More and Understanding Less in an Age of Big Data, as this thought experiment. Imagine a society where smartphones are miniaturized and hooked directly into our brains. Not a real stretch there, Apple's working on it, I know. Now imagine that, after living with these implants, we go to rely on them, to know what they know and 
forget how we used to learn by observation, inquiry, reason. But then, some disaster comes and all the implants crash. It'd be as if we'd all suddenly gone blind. We'd have no immediate basis on which to establish the truth of anything. No one would really know anymore because no one would know how to know. I Google, therefore I am not. You can make the case that we're frighteningly close to this point, blind to proof, no longer able to know. We've already agreed we don't know how to know. There's a very old solution to this problem. Think back several hundreds of years to knights in shining armor and all that, those romantic times when facts in contention could be settled by trial. Trial by combat, trial by ordeal. The chilling descriptions I leave to your imagination or your recollection, if that's your kind of literature. But the deal was still that might did make right, or reading generously, God will decide. God will give the victory to the one in the right. Good will, God will decide, rather, if this person is no witch because she'll survive the test. God will, will decide specifically and on demand. Of course, if you say that the guilty float to the surface while the innocent sink to the bottom, victory's not really very helpful. Despite the enlightenment, these practices still exist in many societies where differences are a matter of honor. But consider this, a fact is etymologically an act or a deed. It came to mean something established as true mainly after the church abolished trial by ordeal in about 1215. In England, this led to use of trial by jury for criminal cases, which then necessitated a new doctrine of evidence and led to what has become known as the culture of fact. It's the idea that an observed or witnessed act or thing, a matter of fact, is the basis of truth and the only kind of evidence admissible not only in court but in other realms where differences are resolved. Between the 13th and the 19th centuries, the culture of fact spread from law to science to history and sometimes even to journalism. Great. We now believe we had a method for discovering a universe of truth impartial, verifiable knowledge. But the movement of judgment from God to us made a lot of people nervous and not everyone considered it an improvement. The whole 18th and into the 19th century truth seemed more knowable, but after that it got murkier again. Sometime in the middle of the 20th, fundamentalism and postmodernism the religious right and the academic left met up. Either the only truth is the truth of the divine or there is no truth. For both sides, empiricism is wrong. That's still with us. Very visibly these days, American politics is a dispute over evidence. American politics right now is mainly a dispute over evidence. An American presidential debate has a lot more in common with trial by combat than with trial by jury. What do we read in the newspaper? Who won the debate? That's trial by combat, not trial by reason, not presenting evidence to a jury and asking for a verdict. Fault doesn't count. With the internet, the era of facts is quickly yielding to an era of data. But think, gathering and weighing facts requires investigation, discernment, and judgment, while the collection and analysis of data outsourced to machines 
with algorithms written by unknown people is somewhat different. Much practical knowledge comes from search engines. We now only rarely discover facts, we download them instead. Of course, when we upload a like, we're creating data by our votes. The internet didn't create this problem, but it is exaggerating it. No matter the bigness of the data, the vastness of the web, the freeness of speech, nothing could be less well settled in this country or in the century than whether we know what we know from faith or from facts, whether anything can really be said to be proved. The root of the problem is that reason except itself is suspect. Skeptics say that all reasoning is just rationalization, that science is just another faith, and really the object, objectivity is an illusion. These ideas are ascendant and their consequences are dire. Without a common background of standards against which we measure what counts as reliable and what doesn't, we won't be able to agree on facts or the own values. Hence, truthiness. I'm no fan of dictionaries or reference books. They're the elitist, Stephen Colbert said in 2005 when he coined truthiness while lampooning George W. Bush. He said, I don't trust books. They're all fact, no heart. And that's exactly what's pulling our country apart these days. But the origin of no other nation is as wholly dependent on the empiricism of the Enlightenment or as answerable to evidence. Let facts be submitted to a candid world. Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence. James Madison asked this, Is it not the glory of the people of America that while they have paid a decent regard to the opinions of former times and other nations, they have not suffered a blind veneration for them to overrule the suggestions of their own good sense, the knowledge of their own situation, the lessons of their own experience. When we Google know, we no longer take responsibility for our own beliefs, and we lack the capacity to see how bits of facts fit into a larger whole. We regress to truth by combat and marshal our own set of facts as ammunition. Must this be so? Have we made any progress since the disciples? Our text from John 8. In response to disciples' questions, Jesus said to them, Why do I speak to you at all? I have much to say about you and much to condemn. But the one who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am he, and I do nothing on my own, but I speak these things as the Father instructed me. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free.